Well, good morning, church. It's our joy to be able to worship together this morning. We celebrate the hope that we have in Jesus Christ as Christ. And uh, as we're going to talk about in our sermon text uh, from 1 Peter chapter 3 today, we have um, no reason to fear and every reason to joyfully uh, endure anything uh, that this world uh, throws at us because of who he is and because of what he's done and what he promises uh, to do. And so we're going to be uh, celebrating all morning long uh, the hope that we have and uh, singing very specifically uh, the reasons that we have uh, to uh, endure. So be looking for those uh, as we sing together. But we're going to get started with a call to worship uh, from Romans uh, chapter 5, talking about this endurance, talking about this hope. So would you stand uh, as I read these verses and then we'll sing together. Romans 5, therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand, and we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. Let's sing of this hope together. When this life of trials tests my faith, I set my hope on Jesus. When the questions come and doubts remain, I set my hope on Jesus. For the deepest wounds that time won't heal, there's a joy that runs still deeper. There's a truth that's more than all I feel. I set my hope on Jesus. I set my hope on Jesus. My rock, my only trust. Who set his heart upon me first? I set my hope on shame would drown me in its sea, and I dread the waves of justice. I will cast my life on Calvary. I set my hope on Jesus. I set my hope on Jesus. My rock, my only trust, who set his heart to leave my Lord. I set my hope on Jesus. Though it offer all its vain rewards, I set my hope on Jesus. Though this heart of mine is prone to stray, give me grace enough to finish till I worship on that I set my hope on Jesus. I set my hope on Jesus. My rock, my only trust. Who set his heart upon me first? I set my hope on Jesus. I set my hope. Set it 
his heart upon me first. I set my hope on Jesus. I set my hope on Jesus. As you, uh, as you know, this time of year is the time when uh, school is back in session and a number of our ministries here at RBC are starting back up again or uh, changing their, what they're doing. We're starting a new curriculum, a new study in our ABFs this morning in the book of Exodus. And so uh, our concentration this morning, our focus for our congregational prayer is on ministries of the church 
and particularly those that are uh, making a change or starting anew here in the fall. So why don't you join me as we pray. Our Father in heaven, we bow before you this morning. We acknowledge that you are our God, you are our creator, our redeemer. All glory, wisdom, power, strength, and honor belong to you. Lord, we praise you this morning as the God in whom all of our hope rests, in whom none of our hopes will ever be disappointed. And we know, Lord, that apart from you, we can do nothing. But because we belong to you in Christ, because we're found in Christ, we're safe. Lord, by your grace, we stand faultless before you in Christ, and we'll one day reign with him. And we are grateful this morning. Father, as your church gathers together, hear us as we pray for the ministries of this church. Lord, we pray this morning for our ABF fellowships as we begin the study the book of Exodus. We pray that you would use our study in this book over these next few months to help us grasp the great themes of redemption and covenant. Lord, help us to understand how this book prepares us to to truly know the meaning of who Jesus Christ is and what he has done for us. Lord, use those who are teaching and leading to help our congregation know and apply the truths of this book, for, for this church is good and for your glory. Lord, we pray for the start of another year of the children's ministries here at RBC. Lord, we pray for the Awana ministry as it begins again and for those who are serving in that ministry. Lord, as these children hide God's word in their hearts, we pray that your word would be the seed that brings a harvest of the salvation of many children here. Lord, we pray for the crosswalk ministry as they begin using a new curriculum and it's meant to show our kids that big picture of who Jesus Christ is from every book of the Bible. And Lord, we pray for wisdom and patience and endurance for all of those serving in the crosswalk ministry and in the nurseries, Lord. Help them to show these kids the love of Christ and to help them, Lord, to apply the word of God to these kids' lives. Father, we pray this morning for our youth ministry. I know that uh, even now, a number uh, of our our volunteers and youth are on their way back from Camp Ripley. And Lord, we pray for eternal fruit to be born this year in the lives of middle schoolers and high schoolers. Uh, Lord, we thank you for those who serve the youth ministry so faithfully. And Lord God, we pray for their holiness. We pray for their... Uh, fruitfulness. Lord, we pray this morning for the many uh, adult ministries here at the church, some uh, of which are ongoing, some which are restarting now at the beginning of the school year. Lord, we pray for the Tuesday night men's study, uh, the Wednesday morning women's Bible study, the Daughters of Grace ministry. We pray for Bible study fellowship, for uh, pace setters, a number of other ministries going on here at RBC. Lord, we pray that each of these ministries would be enlivened by your spirit and that you'd use each of these ministries to conform people into the image of Jesus Christ. Lord, we know that all of our striving, all of our gathering, all of our planning for these ministries would be worthless and useless apart from the work of your Holy Spirit to empower and use these ministries for the building up of the body. And so, Lord, our prayer and our desire is the same one the Apostle Paul gave us in Ephesians 4, that we would grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, that we would attain to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. That's our desire, Lord. And we cannot do this apart from your Spirit, and so we plead with you to do this work in us and through us. Father, we know we belong to you because you have redeemed us by the blood of your precious Son. And we praise you this morning for saving us, and we pray that we might live lives that glorify your Son as we serve here in the church and as we carry the light of the gospel into the world around us. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.
We're going to continue to sing about uh, our endurance uh, for the sake of the gospel and um, specifically enduring suffering that comes because, uh, because of the gospel. And we know that we are able to endure because Christ has endured all things for us. And I just love how uh, this next song that we're going to sing uh, says it. It says, to the old rugged cross, I will ever be true. It's shame and reproach gladly bear. Then he'll call me someday to my home far away where his glory forever I'll share. We endure because Christ endured all things for us and we can endure with confidence. We can endure with gladness, as this song says, because of what Christ has done and because of the hope uh, that awaits us. So would you stand as we sing of the cross together? Till my throne. 
I dare not trust the sweetest spring, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand. seems to hide his face. I rest on his unchanging grace. In every high and stormy gale, my anchor holds within the veil. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand.
mercy meet as the Son of God is stricken. Then see his foes lie crushed beneath his feet, for the conqueror has risen. And as the storm is rolled away, and Christ emerges from the grave, this victory march continues till the day. Strive, give grace for every hurdle that we may run with faith to win the prize of a servant good and faithful as saints of old still I the way we tell each triumphs of his grace we hear the calls and hunger for the day when the Christ will stand in glory We sing together, Church of Christ's victory, and in him we have victory. We sing that his foes lie crushed beneath his feet, and though we still have fights, and sometimes we win and sometimes we lose, we know that in Christ the victory, the eternal victory is assured and it's ours. And so as we prepare to open his word, let's ask him to continue that victory uh, by doing a work in our hearts. Let's pray before we open the word. Lord Jesus, we ask that you would continue your conquest over sin and death and hell and all opposing mights. We pray that Satan, deception, temptation would be removed and that in the power of your victory over the grave, the truth of your word would rule and reign in this hour and in the days of our lives that yet remain to us, that your word would conquer us, that in Christ we might have victory over sin and death. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. I chickened out. If I was gonna begin telling you stories about times in my life when I chickened out, there would be enough. I could tell you about being eight years old, and climbing up to the high dive, walking to the end, and turning around and climbing back down. I could tell you about uh, being a young, uh, a young adult on campus at uh, University of Southern California and uh, having opportunity to stand up for Jesus and chickening out. I could tell you of times when I have been in the role of pastor and elder when I knew that I needed to go have a hard conversation, and at least temporarily, I chickened out. Without being the hero of my own stories, I could also tell you of some times when I conquered cowardice and did the right thing anyway. I could tell you stories, and I'd have to leave the names out of times when I 
I knew that a church member was so mad at me that they might, might actually slug me. But I went and, f- and chased them down anyway and forced them to talk with me. Times when in my life, by the power of God's spirit, I pushed past cowardice and took on the courage that only comes from the risen Christ. And so preaching this morning about overcoming fear, it would be a mistake for me to approach this preaching based on my own experience, even if my experience is in some way helpful to me or even to you as I share stories. Because a preacher who merely preaches out of his own experience is not what the Bible calls a preacher of the word. We preach from the word of God. But the marvelous thing about this text in 1 Peter is that Peter writes about overcoming fear and he is able to write from his own experience because Peter knew what it was like to come looking out. And Peter knew what it was like to overcome cowardice with courage. We're going to be taught this morning by someone who has done both. And if you struggle to overcome fear, wouldn't you like to be taught by someone who isn't just naturally and all the time 100% courageous, but wouldn't you like to be taught by somebody who knew what it felt like to chicken out and then knew how to overcome that? That's what we're going to see in Peter. You don't have to turn to these stories. Just let me, let me read them. Two quick stories from Peter's life. One's from Matthew 26. And just imagine the, the sights and the sounds and the smells. Um, Rembrandt has a, has a painting of Peter's third denial of Christ where the, the light from that charcoal fire just and, and the sorrow and the shame for cowardice in Peter's faith, in Peter's face. Now, Peter was sitting outside in the courtyard And a servant girl came up to him and said, you were also with Jesus the Galilean, but he denied it before them all saying, I don't know what you mean. And when he went out to the entrance, another servant girl saw him. And she said to the bystanders, this man was with Jesus of Nazareth. And again, he denied it with an oath. I do not know the man. After a little while, the bystanders came up and said to Peter, certainly you too are one of them for your accent betrays you. Then he began to invoke a curse on himself. That's ironic. A curse on himself. And to swear, I do not know the man. And immediately the rooster crowed, and Peter remembered the saying of Jesus, before the rooster crows, you'll deny me three times. And he went out and wept bitterly. The irony of the story is that much uh, deeper in that it's not Caesar or even a centurion with a sword, but it's a servant girl that Peter completely chickens out in front of. But contrast that, contrast that with this story I'm gonna read from in the book of Acts. After Jesus' resurrection and ascension and sending of the Spirit, Contrast what Peter sounds like here. In Acts 5, verse 27, Peter is brought not before a servant girl, but Peter is brought before the exact same or almost a very similar tribunal to the one that Jesus was standing before while Peter was denying him. And this is what happens. They brought Peter and his companion before them, and they set them before the high council. And the high priest questioned them, saying, we strictly charged you not to teach in this name, yet there you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching, and you intend to bring this man's blood upon us. But Peter and the apostles answered, we must obey God rather than men. The God of our fathers raised Jesus, whom you killed by hanging on a tree, God exalted him at his right hand as leader and savior to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And we are witnesses of these things and so is the Holy Spirit whom God has given to those who obey him. And when the council heard this, they were enraged and wanted to kill them. You see the contrast. Peter's huddled by a charcoal fire and he melts into a puddle at the question of a servant girl. 
Now, Peter's standing before a council that has all the power in the world to imprison him or even kill him, not just one servant girl, but a huge council, and they tell him and command him, stop preaching about Jesus. And Peter says to them, forget about it. Your words mean nothing to me. With a, with a, with a flint in his eye, and just like that straight as steel backbone. He looks at that council and he says, you don't scare me and you can't stop me. What a change. Peter is unable to even identify with his very best friend who was giving up his life for him in front of the servant girl. And then Peter is unblinking and undeterred in the face of the most powerful counsel he could be in front of. What switch? I think we can see in 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 13 through 15, which is our text for this morning's sermon about how to have no fear. 1 Peter 3 reading from verse 13, 14, and 15. Peter is writing to Christians who are being persecuted and suffering for their faith. And he says to them, but rejoice insofar as you share Christ's sufferings that you may also rejoice and be glad when his, you know what? Here I am reading from chapter four and that's not what I'm preaching on today. Uh <laughs> Unless that was a sign that we just, no, I'm just kidding. Uh, 1 Peter 3, verse 13. Uh, now, who is there to harm you if you are zealous for what is good? But even if you should suffer for righteousness' sake, you will be blessed. Have no fear of them. Did he think of a servant girl when he wrote that? Or did he think of the council? Have no fear of them, nor be troubled. But in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you, yet do it with gentleness and respect. Our plan is just to go through the first half of verse 15 today, and we'll take that, what he says about apologetics and a reason for the hope. Um, Lord willing, we'll take that in next week. But as Peter instructs us by his own experience and by the inspiration, of course, of the Spirit of God in this epistle, we'll take three steps to overcoming fear and to become women and men who have no fear. And the first step from verse 13 is to gain confidence from the question in verse 13, to gain confidence from the question in verse 13. You see the question in verse 13? Now, who is there to harm you if you are zealous for what is good. Verse 13 is a question that we call a rhetorical question. And a rhetorical question is a question that isn't asked because we want to know the answer. Like, we don't know yet who's going to win the presidential election. We, that's not a rhetorical question. It's still up in the air. This is a question like, it, like a boxer lifting up the championship belt and saying, who is the champ? Immediately after the fight is over and his opponent is knocked down, you know, on the mat, and then when, when, the, when the new champion says, who's the champ now, he knows the answer to the question, but it's just a rhetorical question. So Peter asks this rhetorical question. It really fits with the last song that we sang, that in Christ we rise and in Christ we have the victory. He says in verse 13, who is there to harm you? Answer, no one. The fight's over, and our opponent is knocked out. Even though the people to whom Peter is writing are about to be possibly arrested and lose all their money, and even some of them be beaten for their Christian faith. You see, verse 13 follows the promise of verse 12, which is a quotation from Psalm 34 that says in verse 12, for the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are open to their prayer but the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. So, 
If God's eyes are on you to bless you and God's ears are open to your prayers to hear them and answer them and God's face is against those who would seek to harm you, then answer me this question. Who is there who can harm you? If those things are true. God promises to bless us. God promises to hear our prayers. God promises that his eyes are on us. So no one on earth can ultimately harm us or steal that blessing because no one on earth is mightier than God. That's why. You can suffer and be imprisoned. You can suffer and be killed. People on earth can imprison you. People on earth can kill you. People on earth can insult you. But no one on earth can remove you from God's promised blessing if you are in Christ Jesus. Therefore, I can be arrested, but I cannot be harmed. I can be insulted, but I cannot be harmed. I can be slugged and even stabbed, but I cannot be harmed. Not ultimately, because the eyes of the Lord are on me to bless me, and his ears are open to my prayers. Matthew Henry says of this verse, Christians have no reason to be afraid of the threats or rage of any of their enemies. Because the Christian's enemies are God's enemies. God's face is against them. God's power is above them. And our enemies can do nothing to us but by God's permission. Therefore, Christian, trouble not yourself about them and be not afraid of them. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. The thought in this rhetorical question is very similar to the thought in Romans 8 verse 31. If God is for us, remember that verse, Romans 8, 31? If God is for us, then who will be against us? That's the same as the new champion holding up the belt. Who's the champ now? If God is for us, who can be against us? And then just like the audience to whom Peter was writing, that they, they, they were going to suffer and be arrested for their Christian faith. They were going to be persecuted, which may well, brothers and sisters, be coming to us, even in the West, even in the U.S. That may be coming for us. So just like that audience, the audience that Paul was writing to in Romans, don't forget that after Romans 8.31, it talks about um, you're going to face tribulation, persecution, danger, nakedness, and sword. And then he says, in all these things, you are more than conquerors. So you can be imprisoned. You can be, quote, unquote, hurt, but you cannot be harmed. Since God is for us, what is tribulation or persecution or danger or nakedness or imprisonment or sword? Christian, you can be killed, but Christian, you can never have your life taken from you, for Christ is your life. Christian, you can be jailed, but Christian, you can never Lose your freedom and liberty, for Christ has set you free indeed. Christian, you can be punched, beaten, but you cannot be harmed. You can even suffer starvation, but you will always have more than enough because you have the bread of life and the living water. We can gain confidence from the question, who is there to harm you if you are zealous for what is good. The threat of harm, I'm, I'm telling you, this is describing what happens to us, even though it's a simple description. The threat of harm is what punctures your zeal and turns you into a coward. But if you get this question right, who is there to harm you? Then your zeal for doing what is good and your noble boldness for proclaiming Jesus cannot be taken away. Cannot be taken away. Who is there to harm you? if you are zealous for what is good. He doesn't go on to say this, but couldn't we just logically and for didactic purposes put in the other question? Who is there to harm you if by your lack of courage, you forget Jesus, you neglect God, and you don't do what's good? Who is there to harm you if you're zealous for what is good? How can we be more zealous for what is good? This is how, this is how. Put all your hope in God's promises. Memorize Psalm 56, verses three and four. 
Because Psalm 56, verses three and four say this, when I am afraid, I put my trust in you. In God whose word I praise, in God I trust, I shall not be afraid. What can flesh do to me? Memorize Psalm 118, verse six. Because Psalm 118, verse six says this, the Lord is on my side, therefore I shall not fear. What can man do? do to me. The Lord is on my side as my helper. I shall look in triumph on those who hate me. Their hatred of me is not going to make me less zealous for doing good because I know in Christ I'll triumph over them. They can hurt me, but they cannot harm me. They can persecute me, but they can never steal God's promise of blessing from me. The first step toward becoming a less fearful person, the first step toward conquering your cowardice and being a bold Christian is to gain confidence from the question in verse 13. There's a second step in verse 14, and that's that we can grow in courage from the promise in verse 14. Verse 14 says, even if you should suffer for righteousness' sake, you will be blessed. Have no fear of them, nor be troubled. Grow in courage from the promise in verse 14. And the promise in verse 14 is the, is the phrase, you see it in the middle of the verse, you will be blessed. That's the promise, four words, you will be blessed. Grow in courage from the promise in verse 14. This text functions with a promise and a command. The promise is you will be blessed. And then you see right after that promise, you see two commands. Have no fear of them, nor be troubled. There's another command in verse 14. In your hearts, honor Christ as Lord. But there's a promise, you will be blessed. And then there's two commands. Have no fear of them, nor be troubled. Notice that the absolute promise from God is an invitation from God. It's a promise from God that depends on God's faithfulness. And then we're given commands as we follow those promises. It's really important that we get the order, kind of the gospel order of salvation and promises and then commands and obediences correct. And God's promise of salvation comes first. And then come our commands to walk in the way that our Father has commanded us to walk. This morning, we're going to begin the study of Exodus, what a great book for our ABFs to study there are, going to be, there are going to be dozens and dozens and dozens of things to find in Exodus. But one thing that you'll find in Exodus is when does salvation come and then when does obeying the commandments come? Hmm? Hmm? The Ten Commandments aren't given while they're enslaved in Egypt as if God were to say, oh, get eight out of ten and I'll let you out. God lets them out by the promise of his grace, his mercy, the blood of the lamb. And then come the commandments to walk in his ways. There's a promise to you in verse 14. You, if you're in Christ, you will be blessed. And then there are two commands to you in verse 14. Have no fear of them, nor be troubled by them. But the most important thing first is that you grab a hold of that promise. Grab a hold of those four words. You will be blessed. Struggling believer, struggling believer who feels like uh, your intimidating in-laws or your grouchy neighbor or your impossible boss is in control of your life, grab this promise from God. You will be blessed. Therefore, have no more fear of them nor be troubled by them. Don't let that promise flitter away like a butterfly. Take it as the word of God. I can count on it because God is faithful and God cannot lie. Hold hard to that promise. But watch, watch. That promise is hard to hold on to and this is evident from the way the promise is set up. Did you see the beginning of verse 14? But even if, but even if, that gives away the game right there. He's saying you're walking in blessing even if you're getting arrested and they're taking all your money and they're beating you up and they're threatening to kill you. That's because the promise requires faith. If we walk by sight when we're suffering and getting persecuted, it it, it just doesn't work. That's why even Peter, under the inspiration of the Spirit, has to, uh, so to speak, admit 
that it takes faith because even if sight seems like it's not working, even if sight seems like it's not working, even if you're currently suffering for righteousness' sake, you will be blessed. Therefore, have no fear of them, nor be troubled. I hope you can see how that even if works. He's saying you're going to suffer because of Christ. Nevertheless, because of Christ, at the last judgment, your suffering will be as nothing and your joy will be as everything. And the suffering of those who have opposed Christ will be everything and their prosperity will be as nothing. We have an inward confidence that in Christ, we, though the world is against us, we conquer. We have confidence that when Jesus returns, he will rectify all injustices that have ever been inflicted on his people. And out of that confidence that we will be blessed, out of confidence that nothing goes unnoticed by our Christ, then that's the reason why we have hope, verse 15. We have an unbreakable hope. We have joyful confidence. If I am someone who believes, yeah, go ahead and put me in the dungeon. You can never enslave me or take away my freedom because I'm in Christ. If I'm someone who really believes, go ahead and insult me. But Christ has called me beloved. Therefore, call me whatever you want. Christ has called me his beloved then who could take my joy? Who could take my confidence? Who could make me back down? No one. Verse 14 works off of the preceding promises from Psalm 34 in verses 10 and 11 and 12. Like we saw, the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his ears are open to their cry. But it's interesting because it says in verse 14, even if you should suffer for righteousness' sake. So watch, watch. The eye of the Lord is upon the believer who's suffering. But the eye of the Lord is not on them in such a way as to immediately escape them from the suffering. See what I mean? The ear of the Lord is open to the cry of the Christian. But if the cry of the Christian is, never let anyone insult me, never let anyone go against me, never let anyone persecute me, that, that's not the prayer of the genuine Christian. That's not the prayer that God answers. But even if the genuine Christian is insulted and beaten and imprisoned and mocked, God's ears are open to their prayers because the prayer of the Christ follower is what? The prayer of the Christ follower is what? Keep me loyal to Jesus. Don't let me deny him. Don't let me deny him. Keep me loyal to Jesus. The prayer of the Christian is, when I'm in the prison and they offer me my quote-unquote freedom for stabbing Jesus in the back, let me spit on that freedom. That's the prayer of the Christian. Even if we suffer for righteousness' sake, we will be blessed. Don't fear those who would persecute you because you will be blessed. And one of the blessings... Dear sisters and brothers, I, I, th I think the majority of you experience this. I want every one of you to experience this. One of the blessings of being born again is deliverance from lesser fears. It's one of the great blessings of being God's child. We don't fear the ones who persecute us. And I'll tell you why. One reason that we don't fear the ones who persecute us and there will be ones who persecute us, perhaps from the United States government, perhaps from other places, who knows. There will be those who persecute us, but we do not fear them, and this is why. Because, second half of verse 12, the face of the Lord is against those who would perpetrate that evil against Christ's own people. And that's why we don't fear them. That's why we don't fear them. If anybody ought to be afraid, it should be who? those who the face of the Lord is turned against in wrath. We don't fear the ones who persecute us because the face of the Lord is against them. And I'll tell you another reason why we don't fear those who persecute us. I'll tell you another reason why we don't fear those who persecute us. I don't know if you know the name uh, Alexander Solzhenitsyn. 
I'm, I'm rereading his works, not all of them. He, he wrote so much, most of it on scraps of paper in the concentration gulags, but he, 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 he writes about this theme. But I, it's here in this text too. The reason we don't fear those who persecute us is because their persecution of us is driven by their fear. And we are the people who are no longer afraid. Everything, whether it be the totalitarian regime of, of the Soviets, which Solzhenitsyn was writing about, or whether it be Nero or the high priest that the New Testament is writing about, those who persecute us are driven by a fear that is masquerading as hatred and injustice. They're afraid of their sin being exposed. They're afraid of our testimony. They're afraid of the, the salt and the leaven and the light that we're bringing, whatever it is. They're the ones who are driven by fear. And that's what causes them to lock us in the gulags and, and ban us from saying certain things. It's their fear that motivates them. We have been delivered from fear because there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. It's the powerful in the world, paradoxically, it's the powerful in the world who are desperately driven by fear. And it's the powerless, penniless Christians who are lords and ladies of all. Blessed are the meek. They inherit the earth. The powerful world is living without God's blessing. Those who trust in Jesus have the blessed peace of Almighty God, even if we don't have any money and we lose our, our uh, banking privileges or, or whatever it is. The starving Christian in jail is so much happier and so much more fulfilled than Caesar on his throne. What well, the Proverbs say, blessed is, a, blessed is a tiny bit of vegetables where love is than a feast of the finest fat and finest wine where there's strife and hatred. We have been delivered from strife and hatred, which is why we don't strike back, which is why we trust the Lord. Vengeance is his. Second thing we can see is that we can grow encouraged by the promise in verse 14. And the third and final thing we'll see is that we can conquer fear by the command in verse 15. We can conquer fear by the command in verse 15. Have no fear of them, nor be troubled, but in your hearts honor Christ the Lord as holy. We'll stop there. We'll, Lord willing, treat the next clause next week. But in your hearts honor Christ the Lord as holy. I wonder if you can see how the word but, that contrastive word that begins verse 15, functions. Have no fear of them, nor be troubled, but in your hearts honor Christ the Lord as holy. I hope you can see that a proper translation would be instead. Have no fear of them, nor be troubled. Instead, in your hearts honor Christ the Lord as holy. In other words, the, the way to make sure that you keep those two commands is to do this instead of fearing and instead of being troubled. Instead of being fearing and instead of being troubled, you can honor Christ as Lord in your heart. In other words, the way to make sure that you're not fearful and the way to make sure you're not troubled is to honor Christ as Lord in your heart, which tells us, that the alternative to the fear of man is what? The joy-filled love and fear of the living God, even our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. The alternative to this fear is to focus our attention on someone who is bigger than they. So in our hearts, we reverence Christ as Lord. Reverence is it's actually the Greek word for sanctification, hagiadzo. It just means set apart as in first place. Treat as holy, regard reverently, regard as most important, Christ the Lord. Honor Christ the Lord as a holy. And this very phrase, he, he just quoted from Psalm 34, the, the wording in verses 14 and 15 is, a, is sort of a transposition of Isaiah chapter 8, verse 13. And Isaiah chapter 8, verse 13 says, For the Lord spoke thus to me with his strong hand upon me and warned me not to walk in the way of this people, saying, do not fear what they fear, but the Lord of hosts, him shall you fear, let him be your holy dread. Isaiah 8, 
Verse 13 is, I think, in the background of Peter's mind as he writes verses 14 and 15 of his epistle in chapter 3. To reverence Christ as Lord means to know that Christ is in control of my persecutors. To reverence Christ as Lord means to really be sure that Christ is in control of all the events that are happening. That's why Matthew Henry said, Christians have no reason to be afraid of the threat or rage of any of their enemies. Why? Because the Christian's enemies are God's enemies. God's face is against them. God's power is above them. And, you, and they can do nothing to you but by God's permission. Therefore, trouble yourself not about them and be not afraid. So a heart that's, verse 15, a heart that is filled with the holy praise of Jesus is a heart in which there is no longer room for fear. A heart that is filled with the holy praise of Jesus is a heart that has no room for the fear of man. A heart that sets up Christ as Lord is a heart that will not fall prey to fearing this prime minister or this president or this director of this or that or the other thing or this Caesar or this Nebuchadnezzar. A heart that praises the king of heaven is immune from falling down before earthly powers. We don't bow. We don't bow. Not because we don't bow, period. We don't bow because we have already bowed to the most high. Therefore, we don't bow to the lesser. Sanctify Christ as Lord. Bow before Christ as Lord and find yourself delivered from the fear of these imposters who tell you to deny Christ. There's a link between verses 14 and 15. I hope you can see it in the text. The fear of those who persecute us can only be gone one way. There's only one thing that can vanquish that fear, and that's to bow down before Jesus Christ as Lord. The only way to put fear in its place is to put Christ in first place. And there's a reason why the only way to put fear in its place is to put Christ in first place. And the reason why is what? The cause of all of our fear is that we make something that's not bigger than Christ as if it was bigger than Christ. That's game, set, match. The cause for our fear is that we make something that's not bigger than Christ, but we treat it as if it's bigger than Christ. The cause of all our fears being so fearful is our negligence and forgetfulness of the greatness of our God and the cosmic conquering promise of Christ, our King of kings. And it's unbelief and forgetfulness about that that would make our knees knock down here on the earth. If we'll be delivered from that, it's this way, by sanctifying Christ as Lord in our hearts. The way this works is that we can talk about the many and the one. If you would be delivered from many sources of fear, then bank your all on the one. If God is not in first place, if Christ is not in first place, then I will not be surprised that your life is like a ticker tape parade of different fears. This week you're afraid of this conspiracy and next week you're afraid of cancer and the next week you're afraid of being persecuted and the next week you're afraid of this and the next week you're afraid of that because because all of those things seem so large to you. It's our instability and our restlessness, like a ticker tape parade in a, in a windstorm. Because fears multiply when so, the, the many just, they never stop multiplying. The only way to get rid of the many is not to shoot them down one by one, is to bow down before the one. What if there was only one fear in your life? What if there was only one hope in your life? What if in your heart, Christ was set apart as holy and altogether supreme? Then you would be delivered from all those other fears. And all those many fears would just seem like the the flies that they are. And you just swipe them away. Psalm 62, verses five through seven, talk about one and one only. Psalm 62, verses five through seven. For God alone, my soul wait in silence, for my hope is from him. He only is my rock and my salvation, my fortress, I shall not be shaken. On God, my salvation and my glory rests. My only mighty rock, my only refuge is the living God alone. Psalm 62. Those who fear God 
don't need to fear everything and everyone else. Those who trust God, he's going to go on to say in verse 15, those who trust God don't need to fight back. They can do it with gentleness and respect. They don't have to take up uh, Saul's armor. Those who trust God can trust God with the outcome. The reason why is because my relationship with God enables me to deal with any form of relational hostility against me. What would that be like? I I, I say this with tenderness. I I don't mean in, in a judgmental way. Some of you, you need to get way better at handling handling relational hostility against you. The smallest bit of relational hostility against you, it just just drives you bananas. And you got to learn to put up with that. But the only way to learn that is that my relationship with God gives me ballast against all the relational hostility against me. Uh, if, if, If we have, and we don't, so stay away from us. But if Amy and I had stacks and stacks and stacks of $100 bills in our house, and we don't, so stay away, my dog will bite you. But if we had stacks and stacks of $100 bills in our house, and the the mailman brought one $18 bill that we had to pay that day, we wouldn't freak out. My relational stability with God Almighty Does it or does it not allow me to handle any and all relational hostility directed against me? If my happiness is in God, then my happiness cannot be stolen by a prison sentence. If my identity is in Christ, then my identity cannot be crushed when I am insulted for Christ's sake. If my treasure is in heaven and I am promised by Caesar that I will be fined exponentially for proclaiming Christ, I will proclaim Christ and I will laugh while my bank account is drained. Well may the Christian say, you can impoverish me, but you'll never touch my riches. You can slander me but you'll never take away the name that Jesus has given me between him and me. You can hate me, but you will never remove me from the most eternal love in all the universe. And really, at the end of the day, one way to describe my calling as your pastor is to to get you to bank on that, To, to... to lead you to a joy that is immovable and to lead you to riches that are imperishable, to put your forever holy joy utterly out of reach of this world because they are in Christ and in Christ alone. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we bow before you and we ask that you would hear your children as they pray. We pray your word back to you. And we say, church, this is my voice saying this, put yourself in this first person. God, we say, when I am afraid, I will put my trust in you, in God, the living God, whose word I praise. God, we beg and we confidently expect your spirit's help that when we are afraid, your spirit would enable us to place all of our hope and trust in you and in you alone. Bless the preaching of your word to the courageous living of your people. For Jesus' sake, amen. Would you stand as we sing and respond together?
Churches with confidence in God's keeping ability and in God's sovereign grace and his everlasting mercy that will safely bring every one of us home who is in Christ. And we speak these words of benediction to you. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ uphold you and make you strong and courageous as you serve him from this day until the day he calls you home. Amen.